My name is Christina Linden, and I'm the Director of Academic and Public Programs at the Cantor Arts Center. Before we continue, I would like to acknowledge that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. On this land, Chinese migrant laborers helped construct the university and worked in the Stanford's residence. As president of the Central Pacific Railroad Company, Leland Stanford employed Chinese migrants to do the more hazardous, backbreaking work of building the transcontinental railroad. Between 1863 and 1869, 15 to 20,000 Chinese laborers helped execute one of the most ruthless engineering ventures in American history, a colonial project that displaced countless indigenous people and allowed the Stanfords to amass significant wealth. Welcome to this evening's conversation, Chinese Dreams, Livian Yin and Reagan Louie in conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Yin's work is currently on view in the exhibition, East of the Pacific, Histories of Asian American Art, and Louis in At Home on Stage, Asian American Representation in Photography and Film. Additionally, works by each artist have been gifted or promised to the Cantor Arts Center in support of the Asian American Art Initiative. Um, you will hear in a moment from two Cantor curators, Elisa Alexander and Maggie Dethloff, about these exhibitions. But if you haven't ha yet had a chance to view the exhibitions in person, I would also encourage you to come see them before they close. At Home on Stage is on view only through this coming Sunday, January 15th. East of the Pacific is on view through February 12th. If you are in the Bay Area and want to visit the museum in person, uh, you can find details about how to visit on our website. I would also like to mention that live captioning is available for this event tonight. You can click the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. Show subtitles displays three lines of text in real time overlaid along the bottom. View full transcript lets you scroll back up in case you missed something that was said. Uh, we will have some dedicated time for questions and answers at the end of tonight's event. If you'd like to contribute a question, please use the, use the Q&A feature um, to submit your questions. And now uh, I'd like to hand the screen over to co-director of the Asian American Art Initiative and curator of East of the Pacific, Elisa Alexander. Thank you so much, Christina. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elisa, and I am the Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art and the Co-Director of the Asian American Art Initiative at the Cantor. Um, I co-direct this initiative with art history professor Marcy Kwan, and at Stanford, the AAAI encompasses a range of activities, including collecting and exhibiting works of Asian American artists, preserving archival materials, fostering undergraduate and graduate education, and cultivating community collaboration through public programming. The two exhibitions that Christina just mentioned uh, this evening are two of the three inaugural shows of the AAAI um, that alongside the Faces of Ruth Asawa makes up our uh, launch programming um, of the initiative of this year and last. So I'm so pleased and happy to introduce uh, the work of Livian Yin, who is an artist based in New York City who primarily works in painting and sculpture. Um, she is the, if you, um, Ellie, would, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the slide, uh, the next slide, there we go. Um, here is an installation shot of Livian's work on view um, at the Cantor uh, currently. Um, Livian is the child of parents who grew up during the Cultural Revolution in China and immigrated from Beijing to New York City in the early 1980s. And in part because of this biographical connection, Livian's work explores Chinese diasporic history. Growing up in Massachusetts, Livian realized that through, through her childhood, she had, quote, adopted a visual memory of American history, which did not highlight the immigrant communities that evolved here, end quote. Her exploration into archives surrounding Chinese immigration in the United States led to this recent body of work, a project called Paper Sons, to which this painting belongs and is now currently on view in East of the Pacific. It appears in the section of the exhibition that looks at represent, rep, representations of Chinatown by Chinese Americans. 
Livian is currently an artist in residence at Silver Art Projects at the World Trade Center in New York. We are so very proud to say that Livian is also a Stanford alum receiving her MFA in art practice here in 2019. From 2019 to 2020, she was also a graduate fellow at the Headland Center for the Arts in Marin County. Uh, she is represented by Mickey Meng Gallery in San Francisco. So um, lots of love here in the Bay Area for Livian. So now I'm going to hand it over to my wonderful colleague, Maggie Dethloff, to introduce Reagan. Great. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, everyone, for um, being here with us today. I'm Maggie Detloff, Assistant Curator of Photography and New Media here at the Cantor um, and Curator of At Home On Stage, Asian American Representation in Photography and Film. Billy, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the next slide, please. Um, so here you can see um, one installation shot of the exhibition and two of the three works by Reagan that we have on view. Um, just for a little bit of background, um, this exhibition explores work by Asian American artists addressing issues of identity and representation. It's primarily work from the 1970s onwards. Um, and it thinks about how photography, film, and video are key mediums in thinking about um, histories of representation, which is something that both Livian and Reagan, um, I find, think about in their work. So um, Reagan's work is on view in the sort of at-home portion of the exhibition, um, which focuses on artists who are picturing their own family and close friends in their own domestic spaces. Um, Reagan Louie, um, professor of photography at SFAI, um, Louis earned his MFA at Yale University, studying under Walker Evans, and his BA at University of California, Los Angeles, where he began studying photo with Robert Heineken. Um, his work has been shown at Museum of Modern Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Guangzhou Biennial, LA County Museum of Art, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he is the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Fulbright Fellowship. And his publications have also received accolades from the New York Times Book Review and American Photography Magazine. So really such a pleasure to have Reagan here. Um, Reagan has maintained an over 40 year photographic engagement with uh, Chinese America and with China through his ongoing series, The Chinese Dream, from which um, the works in At Home On Stage have been drawn. It's really a beautiful body of work touching on identity, diaspora, and place. Um, and to me, it suggests that a person's connection to place is both enduring and fluid over time. Um, and furthermore, it shows how photography can reinforce a sense of family, community, or belonging um, across distance and across time. So I know we'll hear much more from Reagan about his work. Um, so I will leave it there and just pass it along to Reagan, please help me welcome him. Um, okay. Thank you, Maggie, Elisa, Christina, Biggie. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, this is my first talk in two years. Uh, and this morning I threw out all my notes because I just can't talk about my work like I used to. Uh, so instead, I want to begin by talking about grief and loss. Uh, I'm going to read this to be able to get through it. Uh, we have all been living in collective grief and loss. COVID, global warming, a lack of faith in our institutions, social division. I was struck by how much of the art in, in the AAAI exhibitions came from suffering and pain and grief. We know the pain and suffering caused by the internment or the history of violence directed at Asian Americans that continues to this day. Equal in importance is, the, is art pushing against the daily grief and loss faced by Asian Americans, racism, discrimination, not being fully seen. The daily micro cause, microaggressions against people of color. Asian American artists push back against this hate and discrimination and out of this pain and hardship, they made tremendously meaningful art. Art that gave them solace, which is why most of the work is seldom bitter, but instead filled with joy. Art reminds us that beauty and grace can arise from pain and loss. Uh, I know pain and loss and grief intimately. 
two years ago, our son died in a swimming accident. It threw our family into an abyss. Nothing made any sense. Nothing can ever be the same. But it's not the pain and suffering that I want to emphasize. Dark and light are natural states. Instead, it's the healing joy these works of art offer, that ir irrepressible human spirit. I can no longer see or make art in the same way. The old ways of competition, exclusion, and the transactional are gone forever. After our tragedy, I thought I would fade away and wanted to. But this past year, I've been pulled back by two major events, Documenta and AAAI. Even with all the controversy, Documenta had a great vibe. My main takeaway was to reconsider audiences, our audiences and communities. I want to share my art now to inspire people to become active participants, not just passive viewers or consumers. Beyond collecting and exhibiting Asian American art, AAAI has created a community, preserving our history, honoring our ancestors, establishing hollow ground and future pathways for artists. This is what I'm most grateful for. Um, so to begin, I traveled to China to, fi to find another way, a truer life. Finding your cultural roots as a source for work wasn't heard of then in the circles of high modernist art. And even though that was what I was doing, I didn't tell myself that that was my goal. I said the opposite. I was taking my high powered, educated eyes to picture this exotic world formally. I couldn't acknowledge the real reasons for going and working in China, my need for authenticity. So this first picture, uh, 1979, uh, my San Francisco Chinatown series. This is the photograph that began my journey. My father is in my aunt's Ch San Francisco Chinatown SRO. Windows, mirrors, screens, portals that opened my 40 year exploration of China and search for identity. Although at the time I didn't know any of this, I was on a path to, to becoming a successful artist as defined by the art world, but something was missing. I turned to my cultural heritage, long denied. This was not accepted as it is now. According to modern modernism, it's only about the formal formalism. I mean, anything else isn't significant. So I was pretty conflicted. Uh, do I, next slide or do I control that? Okay. Uh, 2005, the same SRO, and this is my aunt. And I, I do think about, you know, what I love about photography and art is there's many layers that exist simultaneously. And, and, and I wanna talk a little bit about the art influences uh, that work their way into my photographs. Here's an example. The subtitle of this picture is An Arrangement in Red and Gold, riffing on Whistler's arrangement in gray and black. Like him, I was fixated on art for art's sake as the ultimate metric for work. But there's more, of course. It's like his mother, right? And this is my aunt. So th that's this is what's so important about art. It's multi-layered. The picture simultaneously con contains meaning, many meanings, some of which are in conflict and, and intention. And next slide, please. Portals uh, that are important to me, rituals, symbols, signs from my dislocated culture. Next. Uh, so this series in Chinatown uh, I made in 1979, I, I purposely use a very antiquated camera that mixed epic detail with the ephemeral blurs of the people in the streets. It's about time passing the elegiac. I, I thought about my father and ancestors who lived and passed through Chinatown. And I made two China, pictures of two Chinatowns. The public, like this picture of the Golden Dragon restaurant, the site of the last ga gang war between the Joe Boys and the Hua Ching gang. Next slide. In contrast um, to the public Chinatown, I picture the alleyways where private life occurs almost in shadows Lives that feel fugitive, fleeting. Next, please. And all this led me to China and to my father's 
home, our ancestral village named Wing War um, in Toisan in the south of China. He left when he was nine and returned with me some 60 years later. It was his first time, it was the first time I ever saw him cry. He became a boy again. He was home. Next slide. My intuition to fill the void brought me here but also photography led me here. It was my means to explore how my Chinese heritage shaped me. Who were these people? The, the woman on the left is the aunt in the SRL. Next. On my first visit to Wing War, I didn't know how I would be received. It was my father's home, not mine. But the first auntie I met greeted me with a broad smile revealing her single beaming tooth, which was like a welcoming beacon. She made me feel that I belonged. Next, uh, two more art references. This is almost like a Fusan freeze that captures my cousins screaming and jumping up and down as they watch the Polaroid instant images uh, miraculously emerge. It brought me back to the magic of photography as I recalled my own wonderment, the first time I developed a photograph in the darkroom and saw the magic, the, the magic image appear. Next slide. My cousin is lighting incense to honor our ancestors. Here traditional rites and rituals come together to convey the spirit of familial feeling that I was I so hungered for. The gallery behind of ancestral photographs mixed with photos of my family's life in America that were sent by my father with his monthly remittances. Um, our pictorial is our pictorial chronicle providing aspirations for my cousins as well. And in the heat and humidity of Southern China, the snapshots were melting, oozing against the warm glass. They were alive. Next please. And this is a, my aunt with my father. She was my guide, like Beatrice guiding Dante through paradise. Meals were redolent with me memories of our family dinners. And like an enunciation, that disembodied hand points to her. Next, please. I'm lately, I've been experimenting with montages, combining found photographs. For example, the photograph in the middle is one of the photographs that were in, in, the, in these frames that had, you know, created, you know, now have this wondrous, wonderful patina. And I'm combining these photographs and objects to explore connections over time, time travel, honoring the dead. Next, please. Again, the rituals. Uh, this is by sun, a ritual where we honor our ancestors. And uh, you know, among the things you do is you burn money so our ancestors can be well off in the, wherever they are. Next, more mixing of found images. Uh, so this, this picture on the left, you can, you can barely see faces emerging from that muck. And then this is a, a rite, that, a passage. You always put these white, uh, I don't know what they are, uh, onto the gravestones. Next, please. And th this honoring of the ancestors continue. This is, uh, continues uh, even after one leaves the village. So this is a community center that was uh, funded and created by all the overseas cousins. Next, please. So I emphasize this work around my uh, ancestral village, because this is what kind of fueled the rest of my work in China. Uh, so it, it led me to explore, so my, the work in the, my ancestral home guides me to how I explore my homeland, China. So initially I had to dump all my expectations, biases, to see beyond the cliches, beyond the Nat Geo pictures, right? I was witnessing a dramatic transformation from of a country from an almost medieval existence to modernity. 
It was a conflicting experience, as this picture indicates. For me, the girls in the foreground could be my cousins building condos for China's emerging middle class rather than cultivating rice fields. And in doing so, pushing aside what could be our village we wore on the top left edge of the frame, pushing against and pushing aside tradition, replacing traditional values with modern ways. I felt both hope and sadness. Next, please. The guide's ill-fitting uniform is a counterpoint to one dream's totalitarian promise. This is what I love about photography. You know, it does better than anything else render detail. Um, next, please. Prada Panda, lamenting the loss of old customs, the flight from old ways and from nature itself. Next, please. Uh, more, a little bit more about art. This is uh, me flipping the Western perspective of the camera to create a spatial design that's more aligned with Asian renderings of non-hierarchical space. But now instead of wandering poets searching for the perfect couplet, we see golfers searching for their stray shots. Next, please. Shanghai Apple Store. A Chinese landscape contrasts with its shadows and reflections. And I think of the older woman who could be an old auntie of mine, now captured by the strange modern landscape. Next, please. Simply modern enemy. Next, please. Uh, this is melancholy that's pure Edward Hopper for me when I saw this. Next, please. Simulacra, pictures of pictures, virtual reality. Uh, you know, throughout I had all these little you know, projects. So one was to photograph images of images. And, and um, so here's an example. Um, next, Chinese citizens only had the means to photograph their, their lives uh, only in, in the 2000s. Until then, their primary exposure to photographs was through propaganda. But once smartphones arrived, citizens could now push back, create their own photographic realities, and tell their own stories. Next. In this Xinjiang photo studio, photographs also become, can become tools of control as citizens became you know, more materially wealthy. This photograph is a portrait collection of Uyghurs. In the middle are images of Islam. Next, please. Hong Kong, faux Maoists. Playful critiques were possible in the early days. Not now. Next. Protests during Tiananmen created momentary freedom. This is in Shanghai. What's, what's not well publicized is the entire country was shut down, not just Beijing. Next, uh, Hong Kong handover. Uh, the promise of freedom now broken. In the structure of the book I'm working on now, each decade is bookended by a dreamer and by a decade defining event. So the 80s, Tiananmen, the 90s, Hong Kong, the, the aughts, Beijing Olympics, and the tens, excess and repression. Next, please. The umbrella protests in Hong Kong. I love, I don't give, I don't need sex because the government fucked me every day. So I think that's, that's hip hop. Next, please. 90s protests, the facts of Li Pung, the butcher, uh, or the, I shouldn't say, the enforcer of Tiananmen Square. Next, please. This is Jabali, Codras, and a painting of Lenin. I could talk about each of these pictures forever, but I have a time limit. Okay, next, please. A modern day version. This is Lei Feng, a, a model hero, uh, war, war hero. 
and a, a citizen and a not so model citizen. Next, please. The weaponization of surveillance, totalitarian, totalitarian big brother. This is a, you know, China has an uneasy coexistence with capitalism, obviously. An uneasy existence, coexistence with freedom. Next, please. And for me, the tens are about strangeness. The strangeness that comes from the attempted fusion of two different ways of life. It's abstract and big. Next, please. And time. Uh, the, the book is a lot about time travel and the impact of 40 years of the most dramatic transformation in modern Chinese history. This is my oldest friend, Zhao. You meet him on the left in 1980 as a, as a young student dreaming of the future. To the right, 40 years later, his eyes are wide open now. Uh, his wrinkles line his face, representing the cost of, of all these changes. Uh, he's surrounded by the trappings of his second marriage. Um, so yeah, and overlooking the patties, rice patties of Hong Kong. So it's kind of a reverse. Next, please. And finally, the, 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 book, the book is, you know, really about you know, my experience. It's a portrait. Um, this, this boy could be my, could be my a self-portrait of me, or even a portrait of China. He's full of anticipation and yet full of and trepidation for the future. That's partially hidden by the curtain, but also lit by the flames uh, uh, and the promises that they present. Okay. Um, next, please. And it's really my privilege to introduce this fabulous painter, Livian Ying. Okay, unmuted. Um, okay, thank you so much, Reagan. I'm excited to come back to um, conversing with you in the second half. So um, I'm going to talk about my ongoing series called um, Paper Sons, which is the body of work that um, Kinji Zapateria is a part of. Um, before I started the series, I was doing my MFA at Stanford and researching the start of um, Chinese immigration. Since the Bay Area is such a rich epicenter of that history, um, I'd realized at the time that having grown up on the East Coast, a lot of my knowledge and um, interest into this history was vague. Um, like uh, Christina touched on um, at the beginning uh, with the history of the Chinese railroad workers, a lot of that was new to me. Um, like learning that Leland Stanford had uh, started his university largely with the wealth he had accumulated from railroad labor. So when I wanted to assemble for myself uh, a visual history of um, these people who shaped my present sense of home in the Bay. I looked at photographs of um, the railroad workers, um, of farmers around Sacramento and scenes of San Francisco Chinatown. Most of um, the images that I saw looked more like, uh, like this one, like surveys of work sites, or they would be um, ethnographic in motivation. It, left me wanting in a vivid way to see the individual desires experienced by the people who are photographed. And I wanted to see their lives as being um, as complex as each of our lives today. Next. Uh, as I continued to look at historical photographs, many of the portraits I saw were for identification purposes. During the period of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake um, pretty much destroyed the immigration records um, at the time. So as a result, there emerged a loophole for new applicants to enter the US. 
and Chinese entrants who wanted to immigrate could do so um, if they proved they were sons or daughters of Chinese Americans who already had citizenship. So they would forge documents with new identities in order to pass the interrogations during the Exclusion Act. And the people who entered this way became known as paper sons and daughters because their new identities existed only on paper. Next. One of the more well-known paper sons took the name of Tyrus Wong, uh, who was the artist for Disney's Bambi movie. And a lot of his artwork was inspired by um, Song Dynasty landscapes. And I liked how in this self-portrait, it has um, the influences of brush painting, Chinese brush painting, but also a uh, like Euro-American style of clothing. So it made me want to make a painting that combined the cultural influences that many of the immigrants at the time began to live in. Next. Um, this is one of the earlier paintings in the series. It's really small. Um, it's gouache on paper. It's when I didn't think I would be sharing this work publicly. Um, I, for this one, combined a John Singer Sargent um, painting with Tyrus Wong's body position and um, my face on Tyrus Wong's body. And I was thinking about how I'd seen many paintings that um, would depict uh, Chinese objects like Shinazari or these paper lanterns um, or settings like Edward Hopper's Chop Suey restaurant where um, there was all of this Chinese influence, but there weren't the Chinese people in the scene. So I wanted to reinsert that human presence um, alongside the imported objects. And at, at this point, I, I realized that I just wanted to keep going um, with the project and um, and so the name of this work shares the name of the series. And thinking about this history of paper sons and daughters, um, it became kind of like a, a prompt for me to imagine my own um, fake or fictionalized identities. Um, and I also wanted the series to, the series title to allude to these Chinese paper lanterns as a kind of light source, like um, like a symbol for uh, the coming together of Chinese families during Lunar New Year. Next. Um, this was one of those photos that when I first saw it, it was so striking. I couldn't forget about it. Um, it's from a photo contest which promoted China City in Los Angeles. After the original Chinatown was um, replaced by Union Station, there were two new Chinatowns proposed, and one was by the Chinese community, and the other one, China City, was proposed um, by a developer named Christine Sterling. And this China City was built using old movie sets and was meant to be an ethnic tourist attraction in the same way that Christine Sterling had, um, had imagined Alvera Street to be like a Mexican ethnic attraction. And the primary audience was meant to be um, white tourists rather than for Chinese residents. Next. This painting's called The Promotion. And um, in, the earlier, in the earlier original photo, the photographers were there as part of um, a contest to promote China City. And in my painting, I wanted to angle the act of promotion to be um, in the hands of the two Chinese women. So I portrayed uh, the woman on the left as a figure who was also a photographer and therefore in control of her and um, her friend's visual representation. And in reflecting on how the immigration laws um, around the exclusion era block Chinese women um, as a way to prevent Chinese men from starting families and staying in the US. I wanted to paint the other woman as being um, pregnant and with a protective gesture around her body to portray her holding her future on her terms. Next. 
Okay, um, so now I'm gonna talk about the influences for Kinji's Apeteria. Um, whenever I looked for photos of early San Francisco Chinatown, Arnold Genta's photography um, almost always comes up. And uh, something that he's known for is editing his scenes of Chinatown to look more exotic and foreign. And in the original photo on the left, it's kind of hard to read, but there's um, an English signage for the shoemaker uh, that says Kinji. And in the final way that it's presented, it's cropped out. And in a way, when I was looking at these photographs, I was, um, I felt inspired by Gento's editing moves because I felt if photography can perpetuate the idea that Chinese people were unassimilable, um, then as a visual artist that makes me hopeful about the influence of images when um, I move forward with new possibilities. Next. The, the person in my painting comes from this photo um, by Genta, where the historian John Kowich and had speculated that perhaps the young man on the left was one of those storied rebellious women who dressed up as a man to walk the streets at night without drawing attention. At the time of the photo, Chinese women were very few in numbers and um, they also had immigration bans on, based on the suspicion of uh, prostitution or carrying diseases. So I could imagine how freeing it might've felt at the time for Chinese women to go for a walk in disguise, if that was the case. Next. Okay, um, so this is a painting in East of the Pacific. And I wanted the, um, when I made this painting, I wanted to center that speculative anecdote about the woman dressing as a man in Gento's image. I reintroduced the English Kinji signage of the shoemaker, which was my way of also um, like celebrating or honoring the mobility that she granted herself in finding a way to safely walk around San Francisco. And at this time, I was also looking at how the Exclusion Act had led Chinese migrants to enter the US through Canada and Mexico. And there were underground tunnels in places like Mexicali where Chinese immigrants stayed during um, really hot days, or in some cases, those tunnels were supposedly used to cross the border. And in retrospect, I, I think I was compacting a, a lot into the narrative I had in this painting, but um, in any case, the, the underground tunnels were the reason why I painted the subject as though she were um, descending basement stairs. Next. This is a, a photo of one of the Chinatown tunnels in Mexicali. Next. I painted this one called Early while reading about the Chinese immigrants who came to North America through, um, uh, through Mexico and decided to stay in cities near the US-Mexico border. And since there were um, virtually no Chinese women who immigrated through there, um, some of these men started families with Mexican women. And with the anti-miscegenation laws at the time, I thought it was brave that um, the that the Mexican women would choose to be with Chinese men despite the social climate which looked down upon it. Um, I saw political cartoons and propaganda warning um, the women to not be traitors to their race and nation. And I didn't encounter archival photographs of um, like Chinese Mexican couples, but it was just written about in um, some of the books I was reading. So in this case, um, painting from the absence of visual documentation. Uh, next. Um, these two uh, also arose out of the absence of visual record. When paper sons and daughters were preparing for their um, being questioned at Angel Island, they memorized the details of their new identities um, using something called coaching notes. And immigration inspectors would find these notes hidden in fruits, um, peanuts, pork buns that were 
secretly sent to applicants from relatives and mutual aid organizations started by other detainees. Next. This last year, I started to um, feature my friends as contemporary subjects alongside um, historical references. And this one's called Dreaming Host. Um, it's based on anecdotes of the Chinese beauty who was mostly asleep during her appearance at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. I painted my friend Ashley drifting off to sleep in front of um, these like cropped 1893 fair goers who uh, expected the, the beauty's visual engagement. And it's not known if the original Chinese beauty was tired or um, chose to defy expectations to perform. But uh, regardless, I love the idea that she might be daydreaming of where she would rather be. Next. In the first years of working on this series, I um, had a parameter that I'd only use references that were created during or dated to the Chinese exclusion era. And in the, um, I guess like since spring, I felt that I no longer want the foundation of each painting to be anchored by that period of exclusion. And at the moment, the stories of, um, of friends have become the foundation to each painting. So for example, um, my friend Peggy shared how there was a trend of Chinese and Filipino restaurants that doubled up as venues for punk shows in 1970s and 80s California. And it led me to um, paint a portrait of Peggy that where, um, where we also see how Chinese culture intersected with other subcultures in the US. Next. Um, these are photographs by Bruce Connor, who um, made a project around um, Mabuhai Gardens in San Francisco, which is a, um, a Filipino restaurant that became a punk venue. And um, I think the series is from the late 70s. Next. Um, okay, this painting is called All You Can Ache. Um, and it's one of my favorite paintings from the last year. It's um, a portrait of Peggy Chiang, who is also just a brilliant sculptor. Um, she's featured with back patches for muscle aches, and it's the same patches her dad would use um, when he was sore from restaurant work. And the impetus for this painting was that I wanted to portray Peggy aching from um, having too much fun rather than labor. She grew up going to um, punk rock shows on the East Coast and wondered what it would have been like um, had she grown up in her birth city of San Francisco. So I combined the 1970s um, restaurant punk trend with Peggy's personal narrative by basing the architectural facade off of um, Mabuhay Gardens in San Francisco. Um, and in this case, I introduced the name of her dad's restaurant, which is Citron Best. Um, and so that's mostly it for my talking points. The last four slides are my most recent works. And um, I thought we would just click through them and I'll just say who um, the friend slash artist is who I've painted. So um, this is Noelle Troy, who's an installation artist and sculptor, among many other things. Uh, next. Um, Jidong Zhang, who's a photocentric artist. Next. Um, Jordan Wong, an experimental animator filmmaker. And next, uh, my most recent self-portrait. Next. Okay, so um, now we're going to do a, a brief format of um, slide comparison. So Reagan has chosen some of my works to talk about in comparison um, to, I believe, his works. And then um, I'll talk about a slide comparison with Reagan's work after this segment.
Okay. Um, originally, um, Livy and I agreed to select one of our works to do this slide slam, but I love so many of her paintings, I went rogue and chose four. And, uh, you know, she has a photographer's eye, you know, and you know, the tender details, telling details, gestures, gazes, poses uh, in her paintings, you know, offer insights straight into people's souls, I think. And uh, her colors are supernatural and evocative. And her, her, uh, her, her subjects are, you know, historical and, and yet of the moment. Uh, I reflected on my own fam my family's immigration to America, which included a few paper sons. So here I thought when I saw this painting of hers, I thought of, you know, where are these, you know, where do they come from? So these are like my cousins uh, who, you know, wanted, who wanted to come to America and, and uh, several of them did. Uh, and um, as I said, a couple of my uncles are, were paper, are paper of sons. Next, please. Um, in, in, in this paean to women, I thought about time and space, beginnings, middle and ends, uh, past, present and future. Next, please. And, you know, I love the languid poses of these migrant, they're all migrant workers, you know, they came to America, or these three guys in my photograph came from outside of Beijing looking for work, opportunity, a, a better life. Um, and again, living in its people always have just perfect, pitch perfect expressions, you know? So I love all the expressions of fatigue, curiosity, wariness, hope. Next, please. So you know about this painting and I, I just love this contrast of spectacles. You know, Shanghai Disneyland uh, on the left and and, um, you know, LA, uh, as Living described, on the right. And uh, again, I, I just think it's so interesting that, you know, how smartphones have come to rule Chinese lives like everywhere else in the world. Um, and well, you can see what's going on here. And lastly, please, next. This is just about transformation. The living painting is just pure magic. Okay, um, I'm eager to hear Livian's <laughs> pick. <laughs> um, I love the mystery of the last one of the person reaching into the flowers. Who know? We'll never know for what. <laughs> um, so. One of my favorite uh, photos that um, Reagan shared was um, the one that I now know is of your aunt. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what I love about it is just this like heavy accumulation of time and how so much of Reagan's work is um, like coming back to these um, times and places and like through the years, um, your work like building up the kind of accumulation that we see in your aunt's room here. And it made me think about um, on Kawara's Today series, um, which uh, if, for people who are not familiar was um, a nearly five decade long series where Kawara would paint the date um, on a fixed size canvas, or he had like a set of different sizes and colors that he would use and the grammatical structure and language of the date would reflect the place that he was in when he painted it. And eventually he would make these um, boxes that um, had newspaper clippings, which also kind of became this like semi-narrative to where he traveled um, geographically. And so um, one, of, one of the things that um, really drew me to um, uh, Reagan's photo is the like, I guess like the retention of privacy <laughs> of your aunt's interior life and um, 
and how uh, like she's surrounded by these boxes also like the interior scene is at once like very generous and laid out for us but um, these like boxes around her are just as um, reserved and um, private as her um, as her body position being turned away from us and like from from what I've heard um, Kawara was always extremely um, private and like not withholding about talking about his work also and I guess just from um I was interested in talking with you from kind of like a make like the position of just being a maker like one of um the things that like initially made me really curious or made me really like Kawara series is that like um it's just comforting to me to see an artist who's so dedicated to a set of parameters. Um, I'm not even quite sure why that's comforting to me because I feel like what excites me about art making is um, like constant transformation or um, like experimentation through work. Um, and so I know like now we're gonna kind of get into more of a conversation um, I guess I was curious, like, um, what are, what are some points in your own process where you find, uh, comfort or where you create, if you do parameters for yourself, um, to continue to work within? Yeah. Um, Ankur R is one of my favorite artists. <laughs> I loved how cool. you <laughs> brought us together. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I appreciate his rigor. And I think that is a quality or sensibility we share. Um, yeah, one, one of the things about photography, it's a tremendously exacting medium. You know, it, um, my, you know our, my shooting ratio is worse than Steven Spielberg's probably. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a testament to um, the the demanding act, exactitude of photography, you know, you, you have to get that one expression just right. Um, it's like a poem, right? Finding the right words and then finding the right order to to put those words into, to say what you mean. Does that answer your question? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I I really like the like comparison to um, finding the right word in poetry. That I feel like that's a a really nice way to think about entering that work. Thanks. And did you have any um, questions about my selections? <laughs> my thoughts. Well, I liked the um, the comparison of spectacle because it's fast forwarding almost a hundred uh, years since um, that China city photo. And now it's like, in that one, it's it's like so many fewer people, but I just imagine that with the smartphones, like a lot of um, the like crowd and energy around it is like how those images will then be like transmitted digitally um, and socially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'd love to maybe just ask one question that came in through the Q&A forum mm -hmm. um, as we have a few more minutes uh, and the question was just about the I, I think right from the title of the talk tonight this um, this question of what Chinese Chinese dreams means to you mm -hmm. well I am um... I, I cribbed it from a current Chinese propaganda campaign called the Chinese Dream. And you see it signage all over China in various ways from a, a cute little pottery figurine um, to the most garish signage you can imagine of one, like one dream, or, you know, in the, in the form of some topiary, you know, plant, uh, which Chinese are really good at. So, uh, you know, as I said, it's 
it's uh, pretty typical of Chinese um, campaigns to motivate its citizens to do something. So that's where, uh, and then I and then I appropriated it for my own work because I, you know, my, to me this is this isn't really China. It's a very subjective my own experience of China. If you go to China, you know you won't recognize the place from you know my pictures. You, you notice I don't photograph obvious the obvious. You know, no Great Wall, no unless it's it's hit, filtered in some way. So. I'm also speaking about my own dream, right? Of what I imagine I'm doing or trying to trying to do and trying to discover. I have a question if I can pop in. Just I've been thinking about dreams in preparation for this conversation. Um, something that I read that has stuck with me for many years is this idea that uh, speaking of dreams while you're sleeping everybody who appears in your dreams is actually you and Reagan you mentioned this a little bit like the the boy in the photograph could be you or it could be a portrait of China even um and I'm also thinking now about the structure of your of your book that you're working on kind of bookended by dreamers um and uh decade defining moments and so I just want to know for both of you if you can Tell us a little bit more about where are you or are you in the work that you make? And are you there um, as dreamers? I'll punt that over to you, Lillian. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, th I think like earlier on, um, I would frequently refer to um my own appearance and like incorporating that into the figures and so I feel like although now I'm not always painting myself I think um what I do end up painting is for example like when I when I paint my friends like um the strength that I see in them is like uh I guess I've been like thinking of it often like like interchangeably as being something that's like aspirational but also true but um what I want to represent is like what I would myself would also like to um embody so yeah totally there as a dreamer <laughs> yeah so yeah. yeah for me definitely you know I, I see see the um uh dream in both ways as you described it maggie is you know what we do to replenish ourselves you know consciously as we i mean unconsciously as we sleep there's also the aspiration right and so in the structure of the book it's also about the individual versus the collective right so the individual is dreaming like my friend jow this this fantastic future the government is dreaming about you know the Beijing Olympics or you know something else. So there's always that tension between uh, the individual and the collective in every society except our own. <laughs> you know, America, we're so ruled by the individual to to our dis, you know to our disadvantage sometimes. And uh, you know we have to restore, I think, a balance. Uh, and I I see that happening in China and a lot of countries as they modernize, they lose that sense of community that's so vital, you know, that, uh, you know, your work in AAAI has, re you know, reminded me of again and again, you know? so, yes, very much so, <laughs> I'm a dreamer <laughs> as well. Elisa, do you have a question before we close for the evening? Yes, sorry, I muted myself. Um, yeah, I know we're running out of time, so I just wonder if I can just ask, kind of a summary question that relates also to both of your practices as Maggie's did. Um, I, we wanted to bring you together for a number of, of reasons in conversation because we see so many through lines between your mutual practices. Um, I love the thread that came out today about ancestral homecomings, whether that's 
literal and literally going as you did Reagan over the course of 40 years and you Livian doing it in a more figurative way right where you're kind of enacting an ancestral homecoming through the creation of artwork um, one of the other things that we at the Cantor and through the work with the AAAI that we're really invested in um, through doing this work is the idea of creating intergenerational conversation and belonging. And so here we are bringing you together to have a kind of intergenerational conversation. But I also see that um, both of you do that in different ways in your work. And, you know, Reagan, you are a longtime educator at SFAI. And Livian, I see your new body of work is creating intergenerational dialogue between your friends, your current subjects, and this history and blending them together. But I'm wondering, you know, to what extent do you see that intergenerationality being, to, to seeing intergenerationality as being an aspect that is important to your practice and in ways that maybe has that changed over time, your relationship to the idea of intergenerationality, or to what degree do you think about that within your own work? Long question to end. Great question. Um, um, I'll, I'll start. Uh, very much so. The you know um, uh, the last time I was in China I was with my son as he was uh, embarking on doing his uh, exploration of his you know his identity uh, in our village. And he was going uh, to. We're finishing. Uh, I'm, I'm helping his colleagues and professors finish his uh, VR experience, uh, which is almost done. And um, and so I think about you know my father's passage right to leaving China as a young boy uh, to you know to to come to America to find you know opportunity. Uh, so his was a one way. Mine was going back and forth, and my son was doing the same thing, but going, you know, when his American his sense of American identity crumbled, then he went to China to, to find, you know, wholeness. Uh, so very much what I'm doing is intergenerational. It has to be, you know, I stand on the shoulders of previous artists and before me. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I miss in teaching, and but I still do it, you know, is, is is supporting young young artists. Uh, I mean, that's just you know something that's so crucial, right? Uh, yeah. So definitely, art making is intergenerational. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the um, motivation to like work from and around like this intergenerational way of thinking of things like has been there from the get-go or is like part of what initiated my interest. Um, and actually you talked about this in your intro earlier, but um, uh, I think largely due to the fact that uh, both my parents grew up during the Cultural Revolution and um, when I was younger, like they weren't forthcoming about sharing those experiences. So it was something that I knew all of those experiences were there and all of those like lived histories like were there um, in the home, but um, but they were not accessible to me. And so I think that even though, even though my work isn't directly about the cultural revolution, a lot of my um, like interest in speculating and fictionalizing has to do with reaching towards something that um, I can only imagine to have happened, but that uh, doesn't necessarily need to be like factually said or proven, but um, but undoubtedly shapes um, the way that like I experience things in the present. And I think when I was focusing more on the um, on the Chinese exclusion era, I was thinking about how that kind of um, the biases and like legislation at the time continued to ripple into like, for example, like modern portrayals of um, Asian men in Hollywood or something like um, 
I was just aware of how much all those generations were compressed in time through looking into the past. And then more recently, like with focusing on friends, I'm thinking uh, a little bit less directly about like exclusion era and like um, uh, influences and more so about how um, like parents or, or like more recent generations have created this, um, have created like conditions or environments that um, lead us to live the way that we want to live now, but we may not always be able to trace a very like definitive through line from like point A to B to C, um, but that they are there. Thank you. I think that's a wonderful note to end on tonight, um, unless anybody has any last burning questions or comments among the panelists. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for taking part tonight. And thank you, um, all, of, all of those who attended as well. Um, we're um, very grateful for the conversation this evening. And I wish everybody who is in the rain um uh safe safe driving tonight if you have to drive safe passage through the storm yep and come see the shows <laughs> yeah, come see the shows again at home on stage is only on view through sunday so come see it yeah thank you very much thank you thank you Livian, and then thank you Reagan. thank you, thank thank you. you everyone <laughs>